go ahead and okay so now it's recording and people are starting to jump on so mm -hmm. we're going to kind of let that happen um while i do the more formal introduction while people are getting onto the uh the webinar so I want to welcome all of our attendees to Millicent Unplugged. We're really happy that you're here to share in part of this conversation. I'd like to begin by um, offering a land acknowledgement that here at the Millicent Rogers Museum, we are located on traditional lands of Tiwa speaking people known today as the Red Willow people of Taos Pueblo. We continually strive to deepen our relationship with Taos Pueblo through collaboration of events, board representation, and exhibition space, we honor the complex history of the people who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. So thank you for joining us. Tonight's topic is From the Ground Up, Seeds to Solar Ovens. And I'm pleased to welcome our guests, Linda Ingle, author of award-winning cookbook, Garden to Table Cooking, Bob Pennington, owner and visionary of Agua Fria Nursery in Santa Fe, and solar chef and organic master gardener, Rosemary Kern. Much gratitude to my friend and volunteer moderator, Sarah Francis, award-winning photographer and author of Fragments of Spirit, a beautiful compilation of photos, prose, and poetry about the Taos Pueblo. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping for those of you that have joined us and perhaps aren't uh, familiar with the webinar feature. So the webinar is actually best viewed in gallery view. And um, if you're not sure about that in the upper right hand corner of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little um, patchwork and it says view. And if you click on that, you can choose gallery view or speaker view. Um, it's up to you, but we've noticed that it's um, kind of a nicer perspective of the whole panel if you use gallery view. And then also we're happy to have you chat in and tell us hello and tell us where you're from so we can say hello to you that are joining. And at the end of the discussion will leave about 15 minutes for Q&A. If you want to use the Q&A feature to ask questions, we'll bring those up at the end. Um, is everybody seeing the chat on the panelists? Can the panelists see the chat as well? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on to Sarah to get us started. Well, this is very nice. Um, I. I must say, ladies, that the man has precedence because because <laughs> he has Bob, suspenders. Well, <laughs> uh, history will out and time. There you go. Bob's dear, dear parents to me, almost as dear as I'm sure they are to the Pennington family. Phil and Harriet introduced me to the wonders of Santa Fe when I was in college. Uh, that's a long time ago, in case you didn't notice. And at that time, they were traveling around the countryside, fascinated with how they could harvest native seeds. And so since we are starting from the ground up, of course, we have to talk about seeds first. And so, Bob, take it away. Tell us just a little bit more about you and then something about Phil and Harriet and how you got to be the boss now. Survivorship takes care of who's the boss now, <laughs> unfortunately. But yeah, collecting seed, I, I think that it was probably our second summer when really we still hadn't figured out what we were doing and what we'd gotten ourselves into when I really started bringing home stuff from wherever we traveled because I'd grown up doing that. And so ever since 1977, at least, we have been on the road. My wife and I would spend at least a month on the road every summer, primarily in the Great Basin, collecting seeds and things that were exciting and interesting to us, and figuring out if we could make them grow and make them grow in Santa Fe. And for the most part, it worked pretty darn well. And that's amazing. But of course, you're talking to a whole bunch of gardeners here because yeah, 
I I'm hot for it. That was where I grew up and grandmama's giant garden in Ohio. Yeah. Uh, so that's a different place. But uh, the peonies there were taller than I was as a little tyke. And the girls, Rose and Linda, I mean, they have the pictures of their gardens are quite wonderful. So, um, Linda, why don't you tell us a little bit about your garden, uh, which is nearby me here. Uh, of course, I'm in Denver and you too. Yes, of course. I'll, um, I'll tell you, yes. So this is my cookbook, Garden to Table Cooking, and it shares all the recipes that I make from my garden year after year. Um, mm. It's been a lot of fun to write. It wasn't anything I ever set out to write, but um, yeah, I think I'll start just with a little bit of my background. I grew up in a home where homegrown food and home cooked cooked meals were the norm. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Dinner times were special. My dad had his own business. He worked long hours. He always made it home for dinner. My mother worked full time. She always had a beautiful meal on the table. And um, it just was a very special time. So with that background in mind, when I finally went to college in my 20s, I studied agriculture. My dream was to have an organic mm -hmm. farm. And that, that didn't happen <laughs> Life took me in a lot of other directions. And, um, and I'm going to get to my garden uh, probably a little bit later in the program, but just to see the circle, the, how I've come full circle. Um, I worked, I built a career in international sales and I did that for 15 years and got tired of traveling and transitioned to writing, technical writing. And fulfilled another dream I had, which was bringing in foster girls. And I have three daughters from that and been such a joy and eight grandchildren. And um, they're all part of this, they're all part of this cook cookbook. This so and um, well, it was inspired by the fun yeah. things my grandchildren okay. would say about wow. the things that I would make. Do you want to be on and, TV? Um, they would just, I had to document all of them. You know, my grandson, the first time he tasted pumpkin custard, he goes, Grandma, there's too much love in this. There's just too much love in this. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, oh. well, so, may, may I transition to Rose for a yes. second? Because we need to hear about, uh, you have a very important official position still. Do you not as Master Gardener for Bernalillo? I'm on the board of directors for the Albuquerque Master Gardener Association, yes. Um, basically, and I got there because um, 1983, I came from Indiana where we had a little backyard garden, not a big thing, although I liked it more than most of my family did. But And I actually learned more about gardening from, I know, my first husband's mother and father were big into gardening and they taught me a lot about it back there. I mean, they had a huge half acre back there full of all kinds of stuff. And she taught me how to can and all that, mm -hmm. which I, you know, so it was something I learned, you know, in my twenties. And then I got, you know, divorced, but the federal government transferred me to Albuquerque. Now, back in Indiana, you take seeds and you throw them on the ground and they spring up happily and everything is beautiful. And I came out here and I tried the same thing and they kind of went Ew. So I looked around and I found the, um, the program and it is a nationwide program. So, and I know there's one in Taos County. I know there's one in Santa Fe County where they have the master gardeners that will teach you the difference and how to make the adjustments and how to make your soil friable and things that you need to do in order to get things to grow as nicely here as anywhere in the country. So I started with the gardening there and I kind of segued into cooking. I, I took my cooking skills into the solar cooker direction a little bit later and that's another story. I Now Rose, you're talking about how you had a, a huge challenge from Midwest coming into um, uh, our desert conditions uh, to get things to grow. But Bob, uh, he and, and of course the parents, Phil and Harriet, they seem to have a green thumb in that situation. How did that happen, Bob? What was it that they, they 
I don't know. Well, <laughs> you know, some of my earliest members memories are of our garden in a little town in the high plains of eastern Colorado, which is drier, if anything, than here and which is hard to imagine anymore and but we had a spectacular flower garden and i was hoping i could find a picture of it but i don't see it right off top of my head but gardens have always been part of my life now my dad grew up on a dirt farm in kansas so they always grew stuff my mom on the other hand I think the only thing she succeeded in growing in Massachusetts during World War II was radishes. At least that's the way she tells. Uh, that would be my memory as well, Miss <laughs> Harriet. So, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it came from that. How we got into this is, is another long story, but to put it short, I was unhappy with a job I had up in Denver. And I said, I got, I'm looking for something new and my dad, called me about a half an hour, 45 minutes later. He says, how'd you like to own a nursery? And he said, plants, not kids. And I said, why the heck not? And <laughs> next day we packed up and moved down here and we didn't know what we were doing. But we figured out that we could figure it out. Mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's how it happened. It was just that much serendipity, good luck. And, you know. I guess our mission, all of this, I mean, my dad was a minister. I studied theology. You know, this this is our mission. It was our mission. And here we are. <laughs> and so you you raised them up out of the ground. That that's quite a quite a Pretty story. Much. I like it. <laughs> well, Linda has a picture. Let me see if I can find it here. She says that it is her most important picture. And on the left-hand side, you can you can't really see what is it? And it's that the tiny little thing crawling out of the dirt, or I should say, excuse me, soil. To, to be proper oh, about yeah. this yeah, yes we, we know what dirt is dirt dirt's not organic <laughs> uh, and, and and i was taught to that uh, uh the difference by a fellow who does rammed earth construction i had no clue before last week so now i appreciate uh linda tell us why that's so uh that picture just uh rings your bells because it's there's a magical time every spring in the garden and you, you plant your seeds and you water them and you wait and a week goes by and nothing's happening and it's like oh no did the birds get the seeds or did I water too much or not enough or what you know and then one day it happens and it was a couple of Sundays ago in the morning I watered nothing I came home in the mid-afternoon and it's like all the little mm -hmm. seedlings all together in a symphony, pop the soil. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's such a, that moment is magical. It's a joy. And, and the picture you can see, it, it's so hard to imagine that that little thing is going to turn into those beautiful plants and produce just amazing vegetables. Mm -hmm. so. How big is your garden uh, that you use for your personal at your home? Um, it's 563 square feet. <laughs> Plus, wow. I, I lived in an apartment that was 420. So sometimes I walk around my garden and imagine that apartment in my garden. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we have, and then the whole perimeter of the yard though, there's things planted. And we had a sandbox that is now a, a herb box this year, my mm -hmm. husband built. And then there's rhubarb and then there's lavender and there's bee balm and there's elderberry trees. So it's a treat to, it's, it's a, a smell treat. You can walk mm. around the garden with getting the different fragrances. It's beautiful. And as you've been to my house, you know that there is nary a vegetable in sight <laughs> in my garden. It is strictly ornamental. Yeah. Uh, and so I, my my hat is off to you for uh, growing the dinner as well. And now, Rose, you do that in spades, do you not? How, how big is your uh, raised bed garden? Um, the total square footage is 3,000 square feet, oh, but wow. it's divided into <laughs> a lot of raised beds. Uh, the only ground set bed I have is the corn. 
because it needs a little bit more space, but all the rest of them are beds that are about between 10 and 12 feet long by four feet wide and about two feet deep. Um, those are for the long ones. And um, I have certain things because I can at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like one season I'll have lots and lots of tomatoes. And so I'll just do tons of tomato sauce the last a couple of years. This year I'm focusing on lima beans, green beans. I always have tomatoes um, and yeah. pickles. I'll be doing some bread and butter chip pickles again, as well as corn and mm -hmm. potatoes. Those are my primaries. And then I have lots of other little ones too. I, well, that's a huge area. Um, <laughs> surely you, do you manage that all by yourself? Well, you know, that is the secret of it for me anyway, because I'm old now, okay? So I can't be walking around with a hose on every little garden bed. But I have a, a guy that helped me. He dug a bunch of, I know how to do the plumbing, but I don't want to do all the digging. So somebody used a dig a trencher and trenched out uh, from my well site, because I've got a well on the property, all the way out to the garden in the backyard. And then once he trenched out to every one of the beds in the pattern I laid out, we put in PVC piping from the well all the way to the backyard. And each bed has its own distribution system. So I can turn them on or off as they need it. Because some things need a little more water and some things need less. So, and I've got um, six, no, four fruit trees and two pecan trees back there as well in that area. So, you know, it, it, it's a balance as to what gets what, but the nice thing is that I set it up so that I can turn the bed on or off here. Um, and then the well also has a different system going to the front yard, which is all landscape stuff. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Wow. Uh, well, now, I, thinking about this, are you in a, a, a more suburban area of uh, I'm outside of Albuquerque, in, but still in Bernalillo County. Uh, I've got about half an acre here. Um, my neighbors all have horses and, you know, bigger areas. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that's as opposed to Bob, because Agua Fria is literally in, in the middle of Santa Fe. <laughs> and so, oh, yeah. uh, I, do you, how, how big is that? Because my memory is it's a pretty darn big nursery. Um, well, I mean, not maybe like a huge wholesale that has trees and all of that sort of thing. Yeah, really. uh, but it, it's big. And how do you manage to be in the center of town and traffic and all the other stuff? Well, that's one of our single biggest challenges when it comes down to it. We have well, the whole property that the nursery sits on is an acre. And on that acre, we produce a ridiculous amount of traffic and stuff. And we grow everything we can grow and we bring in stuff. Seems like every day we're unloading trucks. You know, it's just, it's, it's preposterous. My own garden, on the other hand, the one of, that I have put my heart into for the last 40 years, more or less, hasn't been watered in almost all of that time. I plant things, and I hope that they will survive Santa Fe environment with little or no water. And that's truly been our special mission, is to be able to grow things here that will live here in perpetuity with, with no supplementation. And I cheated. I watered pretty much watered the whole garden during the last week and a half because, well, yeah. you know, it's been the driest, driest time and certainly in my history of here, and, you know, it's what we're in the and so driest 20 year span in the last 1200 years all over the West. So, yeah. Uh, the picture I'm showing of one of your greenhouses yeah. is, is not, it's not entirely native plants no, absolutely uh, because not. of course you have call from your clientele who oh, are going yeah. to want other kinds of things yeah. and indoor uh yeah. and so i i am amazed at how you've been able to branch out from the totally indigenous totally yeah. as you said uh pretty much xeriscape uh uh plants of all sorts into having 
something that will suit everybody. Well, we try, you know, it's, it is what we do is we grow everything. There are things we really care about, like the tomato selection. Some years it's gotten as high as 80 varieties. And then we say, well, that was too many. And we cut it back and then we cut it down to 45. And eventually during the season, it creeps up again, because how can you only grow 45 kinds of tomatoes? You can't mm-hmm. possibly satisfy everybody's wants and needs. And people will come in and they will give you seed. Uh, two people have brought me very special pepper seeds in the last week that we will have to add to our pepper mm-hmm. equ- you know, acquisitions for next year. So who knows? But yeah, it, we, 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 could, we sell everything practically except aquatic plants. That's about the only thing uh. so far we've been able to not do. Uh, well, here, here's a question. Um, sure. Because we, uh, we started talking a little bit about dirt and soil. Yeah. Um, talk to us about how um, uh, the New Mexico environment of when you're going to put a plant in the ground, what are the challenges mostly? And it, does, it, does it vary? Uh, I mean, Rose, jump in here too, because you will know this, I'm sure. Well, the biggest difference between Albuquerque and Santa Fe is about three or four weeks in the early spring planting season. You know, they can be planting things at least three weeks before we do. I don't know when you put your first tomato in the ground, but... Uh, you with know, a wall of water, at March 1st. Okay, March 1st, with a wall of water. Mm-hmm. And, it, and without? Without, I would wait until about mid-April. Okay. Um, hold, hold on I, there. Uh, yeah. Explain what a wall of water is, because uh, you, you, you just passed by on that, and I maybe some people don't know what it is. Rose, why don't you explain that? It, it's, um, well plastic, long sheets of plastic that have compartmentalized tubes going down them in a circle and you place it around the tomato and these tubes are open on the top and you literally fill them all with water all the way around so they provide a kind of a, they're semi-transparent so the tomatoes get light in, but if you have an unexpected freeze, that water uh, holds the temperature so that the the tomato doesn't like curl up and die. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Linda, do you have to use that on on your garden? I don't. I'm I'm a very simple gardener. So either (laughs) they make it or they don't. But when it's going to get cold, we we if it does after we've planted, we'll cover them up. You know, we'll put tarps. We have tarps on hand by the garden and buckets and whatever we need to cover it up because um, hail, we can get hail, we can get a snowstorm. So, but I know about the wall of war, wall, the, what you're the, what do you walls call them? Of, yeah, cozy, of they're water. called wall of waters or cozy coats, depending upon yeah. which brand. Yeah. yeah, it's just, it's yeah. too complicated for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, there's a rumor that some tomatoes may appear in my garden this weekend. Mm-hmm. And, and generally, I figure about the end of May is when it's truly safe mm. to grow an unprotected tomato. Because until yeah. that time, the ground simply is not warm enough, even if it doesn't freeze. Freezing yeah. is only half of the, the process. The other half is you put them in too early and the ground is cold and they just sit there and they sulk. And we don't need that. We've noticed in Taos that uh, um, oh, things aren't coming up. Sorry, Rose. Um, let me just finish one, my thought real quick. Okay. Things aren't coming up this year um, like in past. And we're actually thinking that it's the wind, the intense winds that we have had is kind of inhibiting. Go ahead, Rose. Well, I was going to just quickly show this. This is a wall of water right here. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's a red one. So, like I said, it's just plastic. You fill it with tubes, surround the plant. Really, really helps. That's yeah. all. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. Uh, in our flowers-only garden, 
these giant peonies were coming out just Ooh. before that huge snow that we had one day on a Friday, it was 93 degrees. Mm -hmm. And by the next morning, it was 32. Uh, so we had quite a drop. And uh, our method is simply using greenhouse cloth to cover mm -hmm. literally everything and mm -hmm. yes it's a lot of work and you have to be careful and you don't want to break things over but we were successful and fortunately Colorado stuff just seems to bounce back once it gets gotcha. started so uh, mm -hmm. we consider we did okay here. Mm -hmm. Now something you might want to know too um, university or the um, New Mexico State University down in Las Lunas is where the yeah. Agricultural Center is. That is part of the Master Gardener program. They run it for the state and all the different counties. Well, I gave a lecture because this is my area of expertise within it on climate and my, creating microclimates for high desert gardening. And part of that is knowing which zone, because in New Mexico, there's 20 different growing zones practically. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you go from the plains of southeastern New Mexico and the heat and dry to the mountains of Taos. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got a whole lot of different things to think about. And that's what my book, which I wrote, Creating Microclimates, is about, mm -hmm. is trying to figure out how to determine, you know, not that book, the other one. Yeah, sorry, um, I don't have the other one up. <laughs> but just to show you, you're a, a published author. Yeah, well, I, I wrote one called Creating Microclimates for High Desert Gardening. It's on Amazon. And it goes into the weather conditions and how to determine where they are. But this video through, you, through NMSU, I think they may have it open to everybody, but I'd have to look it up. Um, and it goes into all, a lot of the different counties around the state and examples of how to figure out your particular for your elevation and latitude in the state because it's the latitude from the south to the north as well as the elevation, yeah. et cetera, oh, yeah. that contributes to the climate you're going to get. And from there, you can figure out what's going to be the best way to determine what soil additives you need from, and it, if you need shade, if you don't need shade, how much shade you need, when to Rose, figure that your last frost date is going to be. Rose, can you talk a little bit about what a microclimate is? Because I, I noticed this before when I was reading things, and I thought a lot of people might not know what that means. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Microclimates are actually in different sizes in a sense. Mm -hmm. We all live in the desert. Within that desert, a microclimate is high desert versus low desert. But even smaller than that, you go so that you live in a valley in the mountains. That valley by itself has a different microclimate than the, than the um, sides of the hills, the foothills or the sides of the mountain, than for the top of it. You've got three different ones there. Bernalillo mm -hmm. County has seven distinct microclimates, depending mm -hmm. upon South Valley is different than North Valley versus the heights versus the uh, mid-levels. And so determining, you know, what climate you A, have, and B, then creating a microclimate that your plants can grow in the best. Uh, uh, the smallest type, it would be like the wall of water. You have created a microclimate for one plant. But for, if you're going like the raised beds that I have, all of them have different types of movable shade structures that create microclimates for my plants so that when we get 105 degree days, it doesn't blanch the tomatoes or the peppers while they're on the vine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you yeah. can even relate to the four sides of a house, you know, the, the yes. growing climate in each side of your house. Very good. Very different than every other. And, yeah. And the, the, the west is particularly the southwest side is so much warmer. And there are things that will thrive there, but, it, you know, they don't grow if you put them on the northeast side at all. And, Exactly. Of course, you know, around here, the north side of a house might stay frozen all winter 
And on the south side, we got things blooming year round. So yeah, and a lot of little things that people don't yeah. know in our desert climate, mm -hmm. we'll sometimes have fruit trees try to start blooming too soon because oh, oh it's nice and warm <laughs> real early. So if you're going to plant one, plant one where the roots around the roots is going to stay in shade until yeah, much yeah. later in the year, so yeah. that it stays cold and it'll bloom later than everything else. But then you'll have less likelihood of a late frost killing it. Yeah, yeah it's Linda, excuse me, Linda. Where uh, in in your small home garden, where where is your vegetable garden? Is it south or east? It's on the back of the house, with it, which is the south. So, uh -huh. when, so you're you have a a heat sink, a a light sink. Yes, and right we there. specifically when we bought our home, we looked for garden space before we looked for the house. Good for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I love it. That that's a great story. Yeah. So and this the, the garden was built before the house was built. So so that's why the flamingo likes it there because yeah. it's on the south. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that flamingo has been with me since my days of international sales. So it's been with me for a long time. <laughs> it's so much fun to see it in the garden. <laughs> well, I've, we've talked an awful lot about gardens here. And now uh, we got to spend a huge amount of time on the cooking part. Yeah. And oh, yeah. so I'm... Um, Gosh, I don't know. Rose, why don't you tell us where you got into the social, solar stuff? And obviously, do I understand that you will go to um, uh, farmers markets and other fairs where you will show the the? I hardware? don't do a lot of it anymore because I've gotten older. But yes, I still do uh, solar cooking demonstrations. Uh, Bernalillo County, the... Um, Agricultural Extension Office here. I've taught classes there in solar cooking and also for UNM uh, continuing education. Uh, we have here coming up in June the 24th, Friday the 24th, there is going to be a solar fiesta at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And that will have everything from solar electric cars and systems set up to, you know, I have the solar uh, the ovens, like the ones you're seeing there behind Sarah, mm -hmm. uh, those are some of my solar ovens. And a guy by the name of Luther Kruger, who's the uh, manager of the Big Blue Museum of Solar Cooking in Minnesota, is also going to be there with about six or eight different types of other solar cookers. Um, the one that you're looking at is a solar box cooker, and that, that can get up to 400 degrees. And I cook pretty much everything in there. Mm -hmm. Now, the way that I got into this was I knew absolutely nothing. I was in Albuquerque and my best friend, Elaine, kept talking about solar. She, she lives in town, but her house is off grid on solar. And I thought that was fascinating. So she was going to the um, meeting of the New Mexico Solar Energy Association and she brought me along and I looked and somebody had one of these cookers out there and I'm like, what the heck is that? And, and here it is, it's making his dinner. I'm like, what? And I thought, well, this is fascinating. So I got into it in a huge way. Yeah, and um, you can take them anywhere because they're just sunshine onto a surface that heats. And um, from there, I started you know, cooking a lot. And the thing I found out though, was at the time they did not have any kind of recipe book that focused on that. They had a lot, there was three or four books that were like, you can build your own solar cooker this way and this way with a box or whatever. And mm -hmm. yeah, those were nice and good, but, but then they had one or two or three little recipes that were really simple things. I mean, way too simple. And I was like, okay, what else can we do with this? And I contacted people that had these and got recipes from Texas to Colorado to Minnesota but most of the ones that are in that book are all from New Mexico and Arizona, Texas, and Colorado. Um, and they're everything from breads and cakes to turkeys and, and roasts and um, how to use them to dehydrate foods, how to use them to mm. sterilize water, boil eggs, you know, just everything. And so I put out the Solar Chef then 
in, 20, in 2003, and the Global Sun Oven Company that sends these literally around the world started going, yes, and they started buying them like crazy. So that's been in continuous um, you know, print since 2003. I've updated it eight times, adding new recipes each time. And so the $64,000 question, Ms. Rose, is how much? Not the book, but the cooker. What, well, and again, what it does depends. It cost? Yeah, you can, you can still build your own, and that's a little less expensive, of course. Um, the one that you're seeing there uh, at this time goes for about $350. It is considered a serious cooking appliance, like your stove or uh, you know, rather than something that is a toy. And the box is about this big and this big and, you know, it gets, like I said, up to 400 plus degrees in there. Um, I, I, here's, here's my favorite thing is when I'm teaching this, about 50% of the people who are taking my classes, you'll never guess what my favorite question is. Just think about it. What's your favorite question when you come to having a cooker like that? Can you uh, burn, get burned? <laughs> you get burned. Well, close. That's close. You're on the right track. Hmm. The, they well, always can you ask. singe the food, I guess. 50% <laughs> of the people are asking, how do you regulate the temperature? Mm -hmm. Ah. Okay. Well, that would be, yeah, yes, that's essential. <laughs> okay. Full on to the sun, really, really hot. Turn it a little bit away from the sun. Not as hot. <laughs> yep. And there is a thermometer inside. So I keep track, you know, and I can cook it. I can cook on anything above 270 degrees. And, and really, you know, the, the, the cookbook that I wrote in it will have on top whether you need full sun conditions or if you can cook in partly cloudy for that particular mm -hmm. recipe, mm -hmm. you know, so. Well, I will have to say that it, it looks hilarious. <laughs> you get a feeling of a beach bunny from the 20s sitting out with the aluminum wings to perfect the tan. <laughs> and so, and either that or something from outer space like mm -hmm. that, that uh, Lasso was going to create a new thing that they were going to send to Mars. So who knows? <laughs> I'd be interested, Bob, you do solar cooking too. What kind of cooker do you use? Well, it's been a long time since I've really done any. I mean, I remember as a Boy Scout leader, you know, it was always part of some kind of spring camp or whatever. You basically you give somebody tin foil and a cardboard box and cook. Yeah. And and you know you could do an amazing number of things from fry an egg to make a cake. And it it's you know, but I don't do much of that currently. I well, when I'm, I'm giving the lecture, it's really kind of fun because. You guys all have solar cookers. You just don't know it. We call them yeah. automobiles. Well, that's true. And uh, <laughs> you can aim your, your car directly to the south and put a, uh, a um, what do you call it, a, a, a pan of some kind up on your dashboard there, you know, yep. and yep. close the windows except for maybe this much to let a little of the heat out. You got dinner cooked by, by you know, the time you go yeah. home from work. Yeah. So... <laughs> Okay, so I'll confess my experience with this, which oh, maybe other, other people have tried. So living in um, Kenwick, Washington, which is high desert also, um, Tri-Cities area. And so my kids are little round metal garbage can lid. We're going to heat this up in the driveway and cook an egg. That's what mm -hmm. I tried. It didn't work. It didn't cook the egg, but it gets hot there so i don't know what i did incorrectly can you tell me what i may have done incorrectly well you got to remember what temperature you need to get it to be because an egg will sit there forever if it's yeah. just out in the open with nothing to contain it yeah. okay so if you're just sitting it there and putting the egg on top okay it's good you might get white around the edges but it's not going to cook so it's the flaps well you okay. like the the box cooker that i have mm -hmm has a heat tempered glass top to the top of it. So mm -hmm. it closes and that's how it keeps all the heat inside. Yeah. You can take a jar, uh, if you just want to 
practice or do something with the kids, you take like a um, canning jar, a quart canning jar. Right. Okay. And you can like paint the exterior black, put a hot dog or something in there that's that you want to cook and put the lid on, but leave it a little bit open because you need to have some air escape because you don't want it to like burn up. Mm -hmm. But you know, and then set it down on top of a black surface or whatever, or inside the box, like Bob was saying. Mm -hmm. And and you can you can heat up hot dogs and soup all day like that. Yeah. You know. Wow. I, <laughs> now I uh, let's get back to to the simple things that I might be doing and talk to Linda about where um, the cookbook that you made came from because um uh, full disclosure here i i had to actually judge this cookbook uh when it came uh to the evie awards for the book uh well that was gosh a year ago and i i read what she had written and it was so clear and so simple and so reasonable it was like there's nothing to it it was as though she was there holding your hand while you cooked and naturally that's why uh well she won a gold award so obviously my opinion uh was equal to the other judges so uh, talk to us about um where yours came from obviously this is quite different from what rose is speaking of so take it away yes so my going full circle when i got married at age 50 my husband built me a garden and so i finally got to live my dream of organic gardening even though it wasn't a farm and my first season, we did just a, a five by 10 little plot and all I grew was tomatoes. And at the end of the season, I was, before we were about to have our first frost, I was looking at my count, every counter in my kitchen was covered with tomatoes. <laughs> it's like, I'm looking at the tomatoes saying, what am I gonna do with these? And they're looking at me saying, yes, smarty pants, what are you gonna do with us before we go bad? And so it's like, okay, I've got to figure out what to do if I'm going to garden, right, with the food. And I didn't even like to cook. I really didn't even like to eat. And so, but once I learned to garden and loved to garden, everything changed. And so season after season, my garden grew by space and by types of vegetables. And I'd come up with recipes. You know, I, I got into collecting all kinds of old recipe books from estate sales and Every, you know, yard sales and to come up with ideas. And then I usually what happens with the recipe, I'll be looking like at a, a pile of turnips. And it's like, what am I going to do with these? And something just comes to mind. And then I try it out. And my recipes are very simple because I'm not complicated. I'm not a chef. You know, I'm not trained in culinary training. Um, but But I like to eat my fresh vegetables and delicious food. It's all my cookbook is all gluten free because that's how I eat. Um, that blueberry cake that you're seeing <laughs> in the corner though, <laughs> that is my mother's recipe. That's oh. the most requested um, recipe, one of the most requested ones that the grandkids want when they come over. When I was a little girl growing up on Long Island, my mother would give me an empty coffee can and say, go pick blueberries because we lived in the woods and berries were everywhere. Ooh. And I would run out to collect those berries because I knew that that cake would be happening. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't, yeah. I, so that's kind of how, is that, I'm sorry, I forgot even the question. How did my cookbook <laughs> come to be? Well, yes, you, you, you've, uh, it, it was a long time coming, but it, it, it was the tomatoes speaking to you from the counter. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, now what are you going to do with us? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And so I, I documented my recipes. I'm a technical writer, right? So I write up my recipe and print it out and I put it in a little cookbook, a little notebook with sections. Then the grandkids would start saying these cute things about it, different recipes. So I would write the little story by the recipe so I could remember. Yeah. And then one day, one of my girls said, why don't you write a cookbook? 
And it's like, ding. So that was how the cookbook was born. And I took it from there. And I self-published because I wanted complete control of, <laughs> of everything. I wanted to own the rights. I didn't want, yeah. I, just, I wanted to do everything. I wanted to experience it in full. Mm -hmm. And one of the birds in the garden has told me that there's another one coming. Oh yeah, there's two more. Ooh. They, they mean, they, they mean, yeah. I, I, one is cooking with chil for children mm. and the other is an update to, to this one, but that will be down the road. It's just every garden season, there's so many more recipes. And finally I had to stop, I had to stop making recipes and get the book to print, right? <laughs> Rose, you probably know what that's like, right? From oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you I, have eight what renditions. What do you add and what do you not? <laughs> yeah. And when do you stop? When do you say it's time to, to pull the plug and, and get it printed? Absolutely. Yeah. So. Bob, who, um, I, tell, tell me about your clientele. Do, are they interested in gardening for um uh, making produce for the family? Are they more into uh, decorative plants, native plants? What? Um... Everybody. You know, there is no one clientele. It's, there's, there's, and they all overlap too. I mean, you know, said we grow, we grow sometimes 70 varieties of tomatoes and that's client driven. And we grow, I don't know, 45, 50 kinds of, peppers and chilies same reason it's client driven and and then that's not enough and they bring me seeds so but uh yeah the the business represents pretty much everything from people whose only real interest is herbs and vegetables to to people who have probably never eaten a home cooked meal in their life you know so we we cover everybody i think it's and now it's that's an interesting thing that you said, because my impression is that New Mexico residents very much are into home cooking, whether they are Native American or Hispanic or um, uh, us outlanders um, or artists or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've always felt that there was a much greater interest in, in doing it yourself well, in New yeah, Mexico. I mean yeah, when somebody from Colorado tries to say that Colorado chilies are better than New Mexico chilies. No, 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 no. Them, them's no, fighting no. words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, even my husband will insist on nothing but hatch chili. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so yeah. I understand perfectly. He's a big chili guy. Yeah, but uh, no, it, it's, you know, I, as a business, we you know, basically cater anybody who like, who knows the green sides up, you know, it, it's, you, you, you can't run a business and, and just deal with one group of people. You got to grow for everybody. And, and, and we do, but yeah, I'd say that the food aspect, growing the vegetables, growing the produce is a huge part of the whole thing. And it always has been. We didn't, get to be growing 70 kinds of tomatoes or more by accident you know it, it was it was driven by our clientele and you know we get the best herbs we can get which means that we can only get herbs from Colorado until from our organic source until mm -hmm. the end of May but because after that you've got your Japanese beetle quarantines prevents that anymore but yeah. fortunately in New Mexico, we don't have enough green grass lawns to make Japanese beetles a viable gotcha. problem. Yeah, mm. we're very cognizant of that problem here. <laughs> hey, oh, yeah. We, yeah, it's, it's a big deal. We take umbrage at Japanese beetles. But now, <laughs> I here's the thing. Uh, Shane used to work for you. How about Shane? the family? Are you passing? Shane? Okay, Shane is my youngest son. Yes, he still works for me. And Sean and Mark, his next oldest brother, still works for me. And this summer, we have the great good fortune that, that uh, my oldest grandchild, Tristan, is working for us. She, she's amazing. She came 
back from the army and I'm ever so happy she got out of it, but didn't do her any harm evidently. And she's, she's really taken on to the work. I'm, I suspect she's going off to Boulder and go finish college next fall. But she, so that's she's four afraid. generations. That's, and that's and, and then cool. in the background, there was that little munchkin walking through who's my youngest granddaughter. And, and she's, you know, well, <laughs> she's another force to be reckoned with, I think. But yeah, she, she occasionally helps out, sort of, you know, she plants, <laughs> so plants things. The nursery it's, yeah, is we're, it's, it's a four generation nursery at this point again. And I love that. And it's wonderful. Uh, that, that's most extraordinary. Uh -huh. And yeah. Linda, do any of your uh, girls, um, <laughs> Uh, are they carrying on your your interest in cookery and and organics? Yeah, I have one girl in particular. She's my foodie that she um, makes stuff from my cookbook and reports back to me. And actually, she's gone way beyond me. So it's she's a big gardener. And but they're all they they're all great cooks. And yeah, yeah. Well, that that is superb. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt a little bit, Bob. I put your website in. I messed it up. I'm sorry. I typed it and typed oh, it. Yeah. Anyway, it's up there for everybody to see, aguafriadnursery.com. And if you go there, there's a lot there of beautiful pictures. Um, so we are kind of nearing the last uh, few minutes. I okay. also want to just put out there, because we're really touching on this cultural aspect of food and how it really touches people's spirits and hearts. And so even looking at the chat, you know, Justin sharing that as a child, he was injured reaching over the toaster, trying to steal blueberries from his grandmother's <laughs> cake in Linda's cookbook. So, so I think, you know, those are the ways in which food and recipes and family kind of merge and intersect. Mm -hmm. And it's really a beautiful thing to share. And I also want to just put out there a little, a little teaser because guess what? The museum has Millicent's recipes. And we're going to be doing something go. around that because there's a group that's working, you know, kind of on it. And so I'm not going to elaborate too much, but it's very, it's very interesting because going through some of that, um, it really, it really helped us understand the complexity of these food voices, so to speak, culturally. And it's mm. really just comes down to it being a human a human connection, you know? Yeah. Um, and we so enjoy sharing culture and family stories and basically the love of life through food and recipes. So I just wanted to yeah. read that out. Yeah, I really appreciate the things you guys have shared. Um, so. And not, not to be outdone, that was a beautiful speech. Um, Everybody says, now, just who is that mysterious Carl that hangs out with Sarah? Well, that that is our garden uh, and <laughs> and the husband doing his thing. So uh, that, that's the fun. Oh, pretty. Uh, yeah, pretty. And that's uh, that's when it was just beginning. Uh, and you could even see the street out there. So we're on a corner and we count people who come by and like the garden. So today there was one gentleman who stopped his car in the middle of the street, uh, held up traffic in order to roll down his window and converse with me about various things. And yeah. we had two mothers with children uh, and one dog walker and one uh, other gentleman who uh, just came by and had to make a comment. So. So, not a vegetable in sight, though. Oh, well. Rose? Well, my favorite story along that line, um, the government transferred me around during my career for quite a long, for many years, and I ended up in Prescott Valley, Arizona for a while. Mm -hmm. The property that I lived in there had the house right in the middle of a very wide piece that fronted a street. So, my husband had his garage and car stuff on one side of the house and the whole other side was my garden the vegetable garden which was obviously just 15 feet off of the road so we would sit around the house and all of a sudden at the middle of dinner I'd have a knock on the front door 
And my husband gets up, goes to the door, opens it up and says, yes. And this lady says, I drive a school bus by here every single day. And I was wondering, would you, would you mind if I, if I got a tour of your garden? Mm. <laughs> it was so sweet. And we had several people that would do that. Just come by and, and walk, ask if they could walk through the gardens. Lovely. Um, uh, that's that's uh, something I invite the children. We have, you can see a bit of the retaining wall in the front. Uh, the dogs walk on the retaining wall. The little kids do. They think this is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then there's a path where Carl is watering there. There's a path that circles through that that we call the sendero. And, oh. and I invite young people to come and walk on it. Nice. So, yeah. nice. Well, I want to respond to the comments. I want to respond to some of the chat again, too. Sorry. But oh, yeah, go I, ahead. I want to reassure people. So I don't have a garden either. <laughs> there you go. Okay. I agree. It's inspiring this conversation. And I there have been times in my life when I have had gardens and large gardens and grown all the food. Um, I recently moved like in the last month, like hurried up and moved because something, an opportunity came up and um, it's a very small space the and I, I'm a, I rent so it's not you know it's nothing great to speak of but my view is like better than this view on this photo behind me it is a million dollar view that I can't even believe I I have so um anyway the yard is nothing absolutely nothing I'm just <laughs> waiting to see what and, and like I said I just rent so I'm kind of seeing what it's doing well I I walked past, you know, because I just ignore things. I'm busy. I'm working, whatever. Anyway, in the last couple of days, I was stunned silence. Oh, my God. It's an oriental poppy right by my front door. Mm. One. That's all I have. <laughs> One oriental poppy. So whoever he, he chatted in there saying, <laughs> you know, wishing I had a garden right there with you. <laughs> I will be collecting seeds on your behalf. Yeah. And, and then you need to go see Bob. <laughs> and no. leave some rabbit brush. You don't well, yeah, whatever. I, you yeah. know, it, I'm about to embark on another seed expedition that'll take me across well up into Ellensburg, Washington. And then, oh, okay. You know, down down into Bend and <laughs> Oregon and back mm -hmm. across Nevada and Utah and I'm hoping that some things that we haven't had for years I will be able to find seeds of mm -hmm. and, you know because there are things that we really desperately want to grow mm -hmm. that we cannot buy seed of for love or money and some of them actually become foodie items you know in one shape or another if you read ethnobotanical literature they talk about things that were used as food and you know, quite frankly they taste pretty terrible so. <laughs> but I, I did find out that say paraphylum ramosissimum which has a politically incorrect common name so I won't use it but uh, you know the the fruit is described as as being used in pemmican and when it's dry and the sugars are concentrated, it actually tastes pretty good. But as a raw fruit, it's just absolutely horrid. <laughs> so, you know, when, when you start cooking out of ethnobotanical literature, I think you need to really be careful what, what you try. I mean, yeah. You know. If I can end on a historical note, um, yeah. reminding everybody that the Bishop Lamy uh, the early prelate who came uh, with, of course, the conquistadores, uh, he was the one who started in Santa Fe. Uh, of course, it doesn't exist now, but he had an orchard right by where they started building the cathedral. And then, of course, his famous orchard, which a few of the trees uh, or uh, ancestors of the trees were at the Bishop's Lodge, which is now, yep. of course, a resort mm -hmm. uh, yeah. up the road from Santa Fe. And so 
he was probably the earliest New Mexico horticulturist who really mm -hmm. wanted to bring something wonderful to the populace that they didn't have. And now we think of, oh, the Villardi area. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful area of fruit trees yeah. and growing things. And it all started one place. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, just in, in closing, down the road from us is Reunity Resources, which is a community garden. And they're doing wonderful things, but they have a sign there. And it says on this site, 5,000 some years ago, people were growing vegetables. And nice. they didn't have a grocery store or a nursery to buy starts from. And they didn't have all the soil amendments and fertilizers. So bear in mind, you can grow stuff here. And people have been doing it here for more than 5,000 years. Thank you for saying that, Bob. That's kind of like their land acknowledgement too, you know? Yep, absolutely. Like it is indeed. Thank you for saying that. And I just want to say, as we're wrapping it up, um, so, so glad that you all jumped on, all the attendees. We've had great audience participation. Really appreciate that. I think we've all had fun. Panelists were fun. And I do need to, of course, say that the museum is open seven days a week, <laughs> 10 to five. <laughs> So yeah, anyway, that. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to be here. And thank you, everyone who attended. Absolutely. And much. remember that Miss um, Karen uh, takes the entire show that is recorded live. And if your friends did not get a chance to hear it, or if you'd like to review something, particularly details about those ovens, uh, or how you can go buy things from Bob or Linda's book or whatever, uh, in a few days, it'll be up on the Millicent Rogers site and you can listen to it for free. So it's on our YouTube channel and I'll send the link to the panelists as well. So you can share the link to the recording, but also you can, people can still register. The, it, the program is available on demand. So if people still yeah. register through those links that you've already sent out, um, they can watch the recorded version on demand. So, okay. Thank well, you. hooray, hooray. Thank you all. You were... <laughs> Didn't Probably I? our best panel yet, of course, but we always <laughs> say that. <laughs> it was fun. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thanks. You're welcome. Bye, all. All right.